It's lovely to be back at the lifeboat again this morning, friends, and to have the opportunity of uh, joining with you around the word of the Lord for a time, and then, of course, around the Lord's table to remember our great Savior. I want to thank uh, Pastor Bertie for the very unusual kind of welcome that I got to the meeting this morning. In all these years, I've never had an applause before. That's the first time that has ever happened. And uh, if there's not another one for another 80 years, well, thankfully we'll be probably in the glory by that time. So uh, thank you, brother. But I was looking around the pulpit there whenever he was giving that introduction to us, and I was looking for this young in the pulpit that he talked about. You see, and there must be head. Because I don't know what age our brother is, but I know that if I died with old age, he'd quake with fear. I know that. And, <laughs> but there it is. It's lovely to be here, and it's great to be still active in the service of the Lord. So I trust this morning we're going to know God's blessing. And then again, uh, later on in the open air down at the park. Really looking forward to that. I'm glad he clarified that. I was at a church here maybe a month ago on the Sunday, and they announced the open air in the park. And I thought they meant the car park at their own church. You see. And I went down in time for the meeting, and there was nobody there, not a soul about the place. And then I'm scratching my head, and I'm thinking, what did he say from the pulpit this morning? And... uh, I had no idea where the park was, not the faintest notion. Uh, The last minute I had to go searching for it, but thankfully we found it and we had a good time. So looking forward to that in the meeting tonight. Now let's come to the Ephesian epistle, shall we please? And let's come to chapter number two, Ephesians, uh, and chapter number three, please. Ephesians chapter number three, rather. And we're going to take a reading from that chapter just now. I will apologize a little to you, friends. I've had an awfully sore throat all week, and I've had more drenches than enough to try to get rid of it, and they're all empty, and I still have it. So what kind of a recommendation that is? I do not know. However, the Lord will help us, and that's really all that we need. Now, we're reading down at verse number 14 of the chapter, and this is the second prayer of the Apostle Paul in the Ephesian letter. You'll find him praying in chapter 1, and now he prays again in chapter number 2. And uh, I certainly would encourage you to take a look at these two prayers because they're very, very enlightening. And there's a great deal in them from which the people of God can benefit. Now let's listen to this prayer, verse 14. For this cause. Now if you want to know the cause, read further up and you'll get the details there. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now, The terms rooted and grounded there means rooted like a tree and grounded like a building. In what? In the love of God. Now watch this next verse. It's very unusual. May be able to comprehend with all saints. So there's no room among God's people for a know-all. Nobody knows all. They certainly don't. I remember... 
going to a meeting one time and preaching for four Saturday nights on Noah's Ark. And I thought I had touched every board and whatever in the Ark of Noah during those four weeks. The following week, there was a man coming who was a missionary. And uh, I wanted to meet him and hear him. I hadn't seen him for a long time. And what did Bobby take up in the meeting but Noah's Ark? (laughs) And he never mentioned a thing that I had mentioned during the whole four nights that I had been there. And that, with others, of course, taught me the lesson that God teaches his people different things from his word. But watch this one. Comprehending with all saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height of what? Nothing is mentioned. Now, When I was at school, which was a long time ago, they taught me about breadth, length, and height, but not depth. You couldn't have a fourth dimension. Now, what's that teaching? I think it's this, that while there's a breadth, length, and height to God and to his word and to the great plan of salvation, there's a depth that only eternity will reveal. You'll never know it all this side of the glory. Very interesting that. Then he goes on to pray that they'll know something that they can't know. That sounds like a contradiction. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. So no matter how deep you delve into the love of Christ, you'll never know it all either. There are still oceans to swim in. This is an amazing prayer. That ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Just run your eye back to verse 20. Now unto him, this is, if you like, a note of praise coming from the very heart of the apostle. Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That's all I'm reading today. The Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own inspired word. Very often in my own searching of the scriptures, when I come across a verse like this, that I have taken as a kind of platform for my remarks to you today, I will ask myself the question, had you written that, would you have put it down as it is recorded here? And every time I do that, I come to the conclusion that I wouldn't have written the verse as it's recorded here. Now, let me explain to you what I mean. Probably I'd have written it like this. Now, unto him that is able to do all we ask or think. And I'd have left it there. And of course, you and others would have gained the meaning that as a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God, God is able, really able, to do all we ask or think. Of course, when you combine the two, what we ask and what we think, and sometimes as believers, we're such unbelieving believers. We heard that already this morning, that we do not really come to the Lord expecting 
him to answer. But he will. He can, and thank God he does. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is very definitely not. So, if anything troubles or concerns you today, take it to the Lord and leave it there. And if you do that, eventually, I have no doubt, the answer will come according to his will. But laying a foundation for what's in my mind today, I want you to listen to what Paul put into this verse under inspiration, of course. And as we look at it this morning, you will find that it elevates the whole issue of prayer. But not only that, It elevates amazingly the God who hears and answers our cry. Now, taking the statements, he's able to do all we ask or think. Let's listen to what Paul said. He's able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think. Take the term above. No matter what you're asking this morning in the meeting, God can supersede it. He's able to do above all that we ask or think. To illustrate, I was talking to a lady here recently who is very, very occupied with giving out gospel tracts and the scriptures, and putting it into the hands of people, and seeking to encourage them to the Savior. And she was telling me that she felt a little bit discouraged at times with some of the results that she received. However, one day, giving out tracts, she gave a tract to a man who lifted it and threw it down, looked at it, tossed it into the gutter as irrelevant and unimportant. And along came a lad and he lifted it. He began to read it and he put it into his pocket, took it home. He read it himself time and again and got wonderfully saved through what what, what was recorded in that gospel track. But that's not the end of the story. She had been praying for results. His father got saved through the track. His mother got saved through the track. His brother got saved through the track. His sister got saved through it. And his very grandmother got saved through one gospel track that a man tossed away is unimportant. Can you see how God can do above all that we ask or think? She was looking for a token. She got a family. Isn't God good? But that's not all that's in this verse. Not only is he able to do above all, but he's able to do abundantly above all. God abounds in ability. We used to sing with the boys and girls, our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there is nothing that our God cannot do. Do we believe that? Time and time again, when I would have sung that with children, it came as a rebuke to me. Because... I was wondering, are you teaching the children something that you find difficult yourself to practice? And yet, it's a reality. It's a fact. God can abound toward us abundantly above all that we can even ask or think. But even that's not good enough for Paul. Listen to it. He's able to do, this is like a pyramid. 
He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can even ask or think. My friends, our God abounds um, in goodness and mercy and grace. He exceeds in goodness and mercy and grace. And whatever it is that's in your mind, in your heart today, and like the verse, you're thinking about it. Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. For remember, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Let me repeat that. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think. What a God is this. How good God is and gracious and merciful toward us all, even in his giving. Now, that leads you on, of course, to think about a lot of things. But just a few that I want to mention in the meeting this morning. Of course, you're commencing next Lord's Day evening, isn't it? A tent mission. And I'm glad about that. I didn't get to the last one because I was tied up in, a meeting, in meetings of my own. But this time, I hope to get along and will be praying that the Lord will bless. It reminded me this morning when Pastor Bertie was naming it in the back room uh, to me that they were beginning again of a tent mission I held outside Kitty one time many years ago. And I met this old guy and he was very, very humorous, very, very witty. But when I come into his yard, his farmyard, whether I've ever mentioned this at all before or not, I don't know. But I gave him the invitation to the mission and asked him to come. And he looked at me and he said this, are you the man from the cloth church? Now, I'd never heard that description given to a tent in all my life before, the cloth church. But, uh, well, that's how he saw it. Thank God he came and was abundantly blessed in those meetings. But my friends, the mission's beginning. Listen, I'll listen. He is able to save any sinner. You got that? And what we need to see happening in gospel preaching today is God raising a few Lazaruses, old sinners. It was the man who founded the Salvation Army, General Booth, who said this, whenever you go out to preach the gospel or whatever kind of evangelical witness you do, go for sinners and go for the worst. I believe he was right. There are some people, and I've heard believers say, that they're a hopeless case. There's no such thing. Any man who has a true vision of the cross and Calvary and the ability of the precious blood of Christ to cleanse cannot talk about hopeless cases. No matter how deep down into sin a person may have sunk or fallen, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all. Get it? The hand of the Almighty can reach from the everlasting throne in heaven down to the lowest pit on earth, and he can save the vilest sinner that truly believes. Come to the Damascus Road. And I see a boy going down the Damascus Road called Saul of Tarsus. And if you had known about him or even known him, you'd have run a mile rather than meet him. Because I often think of the way he was controlled by the devil. We're told this, he was going down the Damascus Road breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He was like a dragon. 
There was threatenings going down one nostril and there was slaughter going down the other. He was a furious man in the service of Satan. And he called himself the chief of sinners. That was his own personal comment. And yet, on the Damascus road, he bit the dust under the almighty hand of God. And God saved Saul of Tarsus. And he became the great apostle Paul. And the chief of sinners literally became the chief of saints. And I believe it was because the people of God were praying for him. I believe that with all my heart. Because the Lord said to him, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. The word pricks is the word goad. You know the way they used to goad animals to make them plow all the quicker and all the better. God was goading him by what he was doing in answer to the cries of the saints. My friend, may God give you Lazarus's. And what a joy it would be to see this fellowship loosing them and letting them go and sending them out into this community as a vital example of what the gospel of Christ can do. I was just thinking recently about old characters that I knew in days gone by who the Lord blessed and wonderfully used, and yet they came from the very depths of sin and crime and folly. Think of one man I knew called Billy Hutton. Billy's pulpit every Sunday was the Custom House Steps in Belfast where he went there to preach. I tell you, friends, those were mighty days. I remember one day I was going to take a meeting in, in uh, Bel Now, I'm not going to tell you to do this for any sake. Don't. If you end up in jail, I'll get the blame. But uh, I remember going to the Custom House Steps just to hear the thing before going on to another meeting. And there was a boy standing drinking. I think it was Guinness or something. I don't know what he was drinking. But whenever he had finished, he chucked the bottle at Billy. Billy just grabbed it. And he put it in his pocket, like this. And he preached away. And the boy was standing, mouthing and going on. Billy just went over to him. And he got him by the scruff of the neck, and he just sent him kicking on the ground. Knocked him flat out. He looked at him, and he said, boy, if they don't teach you manners at home, I'll teach you them here. And he never quit preaching. He preached away while he thumped the boy. That's the sort of approach, I believe, you need from time to time. You see, sometimes we become very cowardly. Why should we be? We're ambassadors for Christ. Oh, there's no sinner, none at all, that God cannot save. He's able to do it exceeding abundantly. Who will have all men to be saved, we're told, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What a mighty, mighty statement that is. You can go forward confidently knowing that God can do it. There's no sinner that God cannot save. He's able to do it exceeding abundantly. But let me say this. There's no servant that God cannot use. Now, here's something that troubles me, friends, greatly today. And looking back over the years, it has always been a problem. And that's door hinge Christianity. People who come out twice on a Sunday, maybe once through the week, and they don't do anything anymore. You know, in the service of Christ. They never think of going out and giving out a few gospel tracts, visiting a few neighbors, trying to get them to the Savior's feet. And we've forgotten that we're saved to serve. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. And the Lord wants to use you exceeding abundantly above all. He wants to bless you. You're saved to serve. You're not only a Christian, you're a servant, bought with a price, redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Recently there, I was preaching in a meeting 
I was taking up this word go. What the Lord said to the disciples, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And my friend, there's a go in God, G-O-D. And there's a go in good, G-O-O-D, and on and on we could go. But just take the word go. And if a, as a believer, you fasten your eye and your attention on no other word but that this morning, this meeting will be well worthwhile. Go, go, go. And as you go preach, you're saved to serve. Now, here is something that bothers me a bit as well, and it's this. In our preaching of the gospel, friends, we're very good at elevating the simplicity of the way of salvation. And if there's a double-barreled text, or texts, if you like, that I love to preach, it's these two here. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And then Paul goes on, not of works, lest any man should boast. I had a dear lady rang me on the telephone here recently. She's a Polish lady. And I'd been talking quite a bit to her after a drive-in meeting that she drove into and stayed and listened and afterwards talked to us for a time. And she's been telephoning and making inquiries. And for 40 years, she's been told that the Lord Jesus did so much and she needs to do the rest. Now she said on the phone the other day, you're telling me that everything that needs to be done was done. And all I have to do is take it as a gift. I said, you're learning. For that's all it is. Uh, that's all you have to do, rather. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. She rang me up again one day. She said to me, concerning the question of works, she said, I want to ask you something. She said, I want a straight answer. I said, what is it? Where is Mother Teresa? I said to her, listen, if works were to get you to heaven, She'd probably be there. But I said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I said, listen, if you're performing works to get you to heaven, no matter how good they may look, or how good you may think them, your works become sin. You'd be ten times better off without them. And as that sunk in, friends, she began to realize that salvation is of the Lord only. Pray for her. I don't know where she is at the minute at all. But it's not of works lest any man should boast. What sort of a place would heaven be if you could make it there and you would stand the half of the day listening to boys telling you what they've done to get here? Wouldn't that be an awful place to be? A whole heaven full of boasters. But all will make their boast of Christ. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sin in his own most precious blood. But what bothers me about those two verses is this. We stop there and we don't go on at times to the third one, the next verse, which is verse number 10. And Paul wrote this. For we are his work Manship. Brother, sister, will you listen to that just now for a minute? We are his workmanship. You are a divine product. 
the workmanship of God. That's why I repeat, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. And God did that and saved you not only to bring you to heaven, but to use you here in this world to maintain a witness and bring others to the feet of Christ. I was listening to a man recently who's a missionary, and he came out with something that shocked me. And the more I've thought about it, the more I've realized he's probably right. He said that 95% of those who profess to be Christians never lead another soul to Christ. That's horrific, isn't it? Horrific. I wonder, I'm not going to do it now, don't worry. I wonder if I ask for a show of hands in the meeting this morning for those who had led a soul to Christ, what would I be looking at? Would I be looking at a well-plowed field with great result? Or would I be looking at a desert? I don't know the answer to that. But you know the answer as an individual. You're the workmanship of God. But then he goes on to say this. Created in Christ Jesus. Go back to the moment you were saved, my friend. You became a new creation. A new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things are become new. You're a new creature. You're the workmanship of God. Why did God do this? Listen. I'm quoting you God's word here. Unto good works. You don't work to get to heaven. You work because you're going. Unto good works. Now here's the bit. This is the bit that I find stings me. And I trust it will haunt our hearts in the meeting this morning. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Can I repeat that? Good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Can I just put a question out to the meeting? Again, let me assure you, I have no intention of doing it. But if I were to start with our sister down here and bring us all up to the pulpit one at a time and ask the question and ask you to answer the question what the works are that God has for foreordained that you should walk in them. I wonder, could you tell me? wonder, could you? You say, I've never thought about that. Well, it's never too late. But how am I to know? Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. I repeat it again. Seek, and ye shall find. The saddest case I met in this regard, I met not on these islands at all, I met him in Mexico. A man from Liverpool who had lived his lifetime in this part of the world and finally had retired. And it was only when he retired that he began to think about the will of God. I never saw a man weep like it. When he told me that God had made it known to him way over 30 years ago that he should go as a missionary to Mexico and he had failed. But as soon as he retired, the Lord came back. Isn't God gracious? God came back. It was like coming to Jacob. What's your name? Whenever his father asked him, he said, it's Esau. <laughs> and the Lord came 
The Lord brought him right back to where he backslid and fell all those years back. And this time he told the truth. He says, my name's Jacob. And the Bible says God blessed him there. That man was out in the streets working with the boys and girls coming near 70 years of age. And God was using him mightily. God is so good. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Go home today and ask God what he wants you to do. You know, I believe this, that you could be pleasantly surprised. It could be something at your fingertips that only you can do. I remember talking to an old man one time, and I had been preaching in this hall where he went for many years, and his name was Bobby. He was the oldest man ever I knew. He lived to 106. And every time I went in, he was there. And he was always in first, and he was always last out. And I said to him, Bobby, what's your position in this fellowship? He says, I'll tell you. He says, God told me to abide with the stuff. He says, I'm what you call a gap filler. Always there, very reliable, very dependable, totally trustworthy. He was abiding with the stuff which God had before ordained that he should walk in them, according to his own comment. Now, my time's away, friends. I've got to stop. I was going to go on and try to show you that there was no crown or no servant that God could not reward on a coming day in order that we might crown him with many crowns. Just to say this, that there are five, sorry, six in the Bible. One of them you're guaranteed. That's the gold crown. It's the status symbol of the child of God. It belongs to me because I belong to him. But the rest must be won to be worn. That's all part of what God hath foreordained, that we should walk in them. I've got to stop there. I trust, friends, you'll take this verse home with you, that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can even ask or think. As a fellowship, claim it for your mission and stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. God bless you.